Hey everybody, Randy Patterson here with Boomerosity. As you already know, I love the blues here at Boomerosity and any chance I get to talk to a blues musician, I'm going to take it. And a couple years ago, I got I talked for the first time with Canadian blues great Colin James and had a wonderful time. I was supposed to catch a show after that with that he was at with Buddy Guy scheduling screw-ups knocked me out of doing that and boy i've regretted it ever since but um boy collins is as great as ever he's got this new album out called chasing the sun and i'm telling you folks every song on it is great i kid you not i love it I, of course i have a favorite or two on there you'll just have to listen to the interview to find out what it is but uh, colin and i said he was up in vancouver british columbia and i here in the great Smoky Mountains of East Tennessee, and we had a lovely, delightful chat about everything. Gosh, we talked about the the previous album, the current, this new album. Um, we talked about Stevie Ray Vaughan, Bonnie Raitt, a bunch of others. Man, we had a great time just just chatting. It was a lot of fun. I think you feel like you're just sitting there with us as you watch or listen to this. And if you don't mind, when you're done listening, would you, or even while you're listening, would you hit like? and subscribe on whatever platform you're watching or listening to this on and go ahead and share it with your friends that you think might enjoy it as well and ask them to do the same thing. So without any further ado, here is my second of what I hope are many more interviews with blues great Colin James. And uh, I, I just know you're going to love it. Have I told you that already? <laughs> anyway, until next time, this is Randy Patterson with Boomerosity. Take care. It's been a couple of years since I talked to you. What's what's happened in the last couple of years before we chat about your album? Well, I guess we would have talked at Open Road. We would have talked to my last record. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, uh, you know, uh, I mean, I think <laughs> I I think we're all still kind of recovering from the pandemic blip. You know, I mean, I think that was so that was such a resounding issue especially for musicians or anyone involved in the music industry because of course as you know everything stopped so i guess we're just trying to get back on on footing you know i i made the record in a pretty timely manner maybe a little longer than i would have liked from the last one but um well no it was it was all right no we're back on schedule and i'm in that weird zone now where you've had a record done for a while and now you have to talk about it and you you know it wasn't that long. I guess I went in in October to Nashville and we did overdubs during, you know, no, November, December and into January with mixes. And uh, and then you have that kind of dead period where you, you know, it's not out and it's not calling out. And, then, you know, it's a weird time, you know, and you have to sit there and just basically put your record to bed in your mind. You have to just kind of go, all right, uh, as an, I, you know, it's done put it away, move on and just live your life until it's ready. So now I'm going to that phase where it's ready. <laughs> <laughs> now you got to remember everything about it, right? <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. And even names, like I got, I mean, just kind of trying to remember who played saxophone, Jim Hoke and, you know, all those little deets. <laughs> so how long you, so you said it took what, about four months from beginning to it being ready to, for packaging, more or less, roughly? Yeah, I mean, we, we I went straight off the road, straight to Nashville. We recorded in a little studio behind Colin Linden's house uh, in Nashville. And uh, it's pretty cool because he built it to be a studio. It wasn't like an afterthought. So you got a nice little coffee area and then a bedroom where I slept. My 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 station was right at the end of my bed. So I'd have a couple coffees. And then Daryl Jones and Charlie Drayden would walk in and it basically into my, Daryl was, I, my bed was here. My station was at the foot of my bed. And then Daryl Jones right here. And I'd never met Daryl or Charlie. Charlie, I'd, we were on the same label with Virgin America years ago. Mm -hmm. And I opened up a bunch of shows with the Keith Richards Take It So Hard tour way back then. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I never met Charlie and just watched with awe from a distance going, whoa, what a, you know, what a, what a player. And um, anyway, so that was, you know, that was kind of heady because we started writing up my own songs and you're always like a little self-conscious about your own songs. You don't try to be, but you know, you've written them in your head. You've, 
you demoed them and now here here's a member of the Rolling Stones and <laughs> you know you know it, it, it's a little hard on that on the head as far as just you know you got to keep it in as like I don't know don't make any excuses just, you know it's all right and uh, we just went in at it and um what a nice couple people they were man Daryl uh you know all those you know years with Miles Davis and Sting and and you wouldn't know it his attitude was just a team effort and a nice person and uh, wonderful and Charlie the same way so and Colin and I Lyndon we go back to when I was 13 years old we oh, I met wow. Colin when I was yeah I met Colin when I was 13 and he was 16 and at that time Colin was a young he was on the tip of everyone's tongue because he was so young, but knew how to play like Blind Blake and Robert Johnson and Tommy Johnson and Sun House. And I mean, he knew everybody and was quite a piece of work. And I, we met and became kind of instant friends because we had the same name and we both played. And I was, I was just a little guy on a thir you know, 13 year old. And he went, you know, he was just really kind uh, way back then. And we just, this is our, I think our fifth record together. Wow. Wow. Yeah. 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 You, you mentioned Daryl and uh, Charlie Drayton. I, I mean, I've interviewed some of the guys in the Stones. One of them already gone um, over the years. I've interviewed, um, oh, God, my Arlene. Uh, Chuck Waddell a few times. Oh, yeah. And, yeah. and uh, Bobby Keys before he passed. I interviewed him when he came out with this book. That was early on. And then, um, yeah. Uh, uh, Lisa Fisher before she left the band, Bernard Fowler a few times, and every one oh. of those people. I mean, you you think they're working with the bad boys of rock and roll, and I'm thinking they're going to kick my butt, they're going to chew me up and spit me out. And every uh, one of them, every one of yeah. them, just gracious and kind, and you know, I I was blown away by all of them, and I I've heard the same about Daryl. I hope to talk to him sometime, but I, I've heard He's great things about him. So. absolutely fabulous and, and i mean just like you know yeah just great and chuck you know i chuck played on some of my little big band records years ago so chuck and i go way back and i, yeah. I love chuck i didn't see them when they played vancouver the other day sadly but yeah I've, I've i seen missed that i missed the tour this time all together i saw them the last tour when they hit nashville at uh, nissan stadium but uh um, right. that was what three years ago but um yeah uh, it was that and the lockdown was just kind of lifting you know i, I saw right saw clapton over at the bridgestone a couple of weeks before that and right. everybody's just i mean i'm expecting all these masks and i mean especially in nashville right because they tend to lean that way but no man everybody was it's like lemon's whip women's lip in the bra you know the, the <laughs> masks were gone you know yeah right 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 do, yeah. do you ever get used to working with great i mean you're a great musician so i don't mean that when i ask this i'm not asking it to minimize your impact and your your level of expertise but i mean to go in with these guys that see big names all the time and you know we already talked about daryl and charlie but you know, you've worked with Lucinda, you worked with Charlie Musselwhite. I mean, these are great names too. And yeah. do you, I mean, I interview people like you guys and I'm still pinching myself and I'm in my 16th year doing it. <laughs> yeah, how yeah. does it hit you working with people like that? Well, my experience has been so positive that way. Like I've never met you know, I was a Van Morrison fan, and he's one guy I, I, I didn't go say hi to because I've heard things, and I just didn't want to. I just didn't want to get into it. Most people I've met, and I can say this from Keith Richards to, to Chuck to, have just been so not Mavis Staples. Mm. You couldn't ask for a nicer, more giving person. Bonnie Raitt, she's been such a champion for me. Um. And such a a, a, a fantastic uh, woman. I, I've known her for years now. I just love her. I've just never met someone who I was a real fan of and being shocked at how much of a jerk they were. It's just never happened to me yet. But uh, I'm sure there's always, <laughs> there's always a room in the future. <laughs> but uh, no, I've just been lucky that way. Chuck, I went back to Chuck's house years ago and wrote songs with him down in, in uh, outside of Macon there. Yeah. And, you know, just so far, my experience that way is just being so positive. But, yeah, I get nervous. 
you know, Lucinda came over to the house for dinner the night before she, she tracked on that song. And we hadn't, she wasn't, there was no talk about her tracking on that song. She's just a friend of Colin's and I know her. I got to meet her a few times over the years. Um, you know, just loosely at the end of shows, just, you know, and, um, it just kind of holistically happened. I had never sung protection before this, the, the first song on the record. I love that. So cover I was listening. <laughs> oh, thank you. And I, and it couldn't have been a better rhythm section for that song. And I like, and I think that's what really enthused Lucinda. Cause she's a huge fan of Charlie Drayton's and, and, and Daryl's as well. So I think she was, you know, we all had dinner the night before, but you know, I think, um, she just, I had to sing it in front of her and there's a lot of words in that song. It's not so much that, but there's a lot of meter, like I got, I got protection from the enemies of kind of rock and roll kindness of soul. You gotta, you gotta, there's all these different words and you gotta get your timing. And I had to sing it in front of her having <laughs> never really sung it before. So that was embarrassing, but she was great. She, she, she came in and said, Oh, you know, here you should maybe, you got to get that word in there. And I think you got the words wrong here, by the way. And she was like, cross this stuff. She was a fabulous. And then she just started singing on the mic and just off we went. And she was ended up being a duet. And I, I had no idea that was going to happen. So I was super pleased and, and uh, thankful. Yeah. What what went into your song selection process and all that? I mean, picking one of her songs and, you know, you, you, uh, were there others that were... I mean, you have your own stuff. You did the covers. What, what, what kind of led to this mix? Well, the last three records, I didn't do as much original music, and I've done all original music on my records in the past. This is my twenty-first record, you know, and and uh, I don't. I've never been weird about doing covers. Like, I'm I'm fine with that. Um, I I find if if you feel like you can bring something to a song go ahead and do it. You know, like if you don't think you can, don't do it. Like if, if you listen back and go, well, I'm not adding anything. Well then don't do it. But I think, you know, I've been, sometimes songs are ready for a redo, you know, sometimes because of technology, the way it was mixed in the first place, there's a myriad of reasons. And, uh, besides keeping the, the genre alive and, um, so I've never been weird about it, but on my last three, I didn't do a lot. So I felt a little pressure to come to the table with my own material this time uh, after three in a row. And I did songs of my own on those records as well, but one or two. Right. So, um, so I really kind of went in with my, my, I really tried to get, you know, writing, you know, writing is a, a, one of those tough things. Like I grew up playing, playing music of my heroes. And that was more important to me to, you know, I wanted to be like a John, like John Hammond or like these people I loved. So I never thought about writing until I got my first record contract. And I was like, oh my God, what? You want me to write all, you know, I was like, it just never really occurred to me. And um, I had a couple early hits here in Canada that were pretty big hits. So that was encouraging, I suppose. <laughs> but um uh, you know, it was never something that I professed to be a, uh, it's hard. You got to work at writing and it, it's like, it just doesn't come on a platter and yeah. you, you, yeah, you got to have those disappointments, you know, for, for every five songs you start, maybe one or two is going to be the one that you go, oh, Hey man, I really like that. So, um, anyway, th I guess it's a long way of saying I, I wanted more this time and, and, uh, tried to try to make that happen. And, um, um, you know, it's, it's an amazing process when it works. And, uh, it's a, one of those muscles you have to keep flexing because I think singing always came relatively naturally to me and then playing and, um, but writing is the thing you got to work on. I, I, for me, people think it's easy, but I mean, I, I'm not a musician, but whenever I have to write an article or something, it, I, I mean, and I'm not trying to put notes to it or, you know, fix it into a certain cadence, but it's, it's tough enough, you know? Uh, so I can imagine what you're doing is, is even more and us fans. We just listen to it and go, 
Yeah, I like that song. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> He's well, sweating over it, you know. <laughs> yeah. Well, I find it especially in, in the blues idiom because yeah. some of the, you know, like Willie Dixon wrote the, the Bible on that, you know, and, in, in, and, and it's always in its simplicity that it shines. You know, it's not a wordy thing. It's not a, uh, so you got to, you know, in contemporary life, you can easily get too wordy. We have a different vocabulary now and years have gone by and, and you got to be careful not to, uh, I don't know, it's got to feel natural. And I find the blues idiom can be so um, easily rife with tropes or, you know, black magic woman, you know, like there's so many uh, ways you could fall into traps. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, 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 and eventually be inauthentic if you're not careful. Yeah. So I, I think that's the danger, you know, really trying to, trying to create a level that, um, I don't know that you're happy with. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Well, blues, uh, you know, I'm, I'm just still pleasantly surprised that, you know, it's been on a good solid upward trajectory and not just cycled out real quick. You know, it seems to have, you know, it's always around, right? But it seems like the popularity with ebb, ebb and flow over the years. And now it's just been, you know, I think it's a testament to people like you, like Bonamassa, like Kenny Wayne Shepherd, all, all you guys that are in the genre and doing it and doing it extremely well and keeping it fresh, not just alive, but keeping it fresh. That's yeah. what I think is key because keeping it alive, you know, it, it could just be on, you know, heart machine, right? And just sound kind of redundant. But but you guys are doing the heavy lifting on it and keeping it keeping it fresh. And that's what I love about the new stuff coming out. Twenty one albums. What surprises? Were there any surprises in putting this album together that you hadn't run into or were were pleasant surprises for you? I know, you know, we mentioned about who worked on the album with you, but were there any other surprises there? Well, I got I got to put a shout out to this one woman I that sang, came and sang. I mean, the McCrary sisters in Nashville are fantastic. Yeah, I've yeah. worked with them before, and they're fantastic. But there was a woman named Ruby Amanfu in uh, Nashville, a young lady who came in and sang on uh, um, uh, da, 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 da. Uh, what's the song that I'm blanking like, on the day. <laughs> she sings on a song on the record, and she had this be beautiful, uh, just a beautiful voice. And I, I got to sing with her on that song, and uh, um, I, I really enjoyed that. I mean, apart from that, I had to engineer a fair, some of the record myself because you know I, I did all the all the work with Colin, and he had a beautiful U sixty seven nineteen sixties mic. I came back here to Vancouver and I had a nice mic, but it wasn't a U67. So <laughs> Toy I, <bought> U <laughs> <laughs> I had to buy a U67 because I got back here. I had a C12 and AKG, beautiful mic, tube mic like this is. But I realized that I wasn't going to be able to complete the vocals. Like we weren't completing whole tracks. We were just putting words in here and there. And I, I sent him a couple tracks and he says, you know, I'm really noticing a huge microphone difference. And I went, oh my God, I'm going to have to buy a mic. No, twist my rubber arm. <laughs> at, the, at the end of the but, day. So your wife is going, not only guitar is like you're hanging in the background. Now you're buying microphones. Why? Yeah, yeah. Heck, right. So, <laughs> well, a mic like that's a mic for life. And, and um, <laughs> so, but anyway, the long short of the story was I had to, I've never worked on Pro Tools a lot. So I had to kind of become an engineer because I had guitar overdubs to do. So I had to mic up my own stuff, set my own stuff, mm. put it on tape, consolidate, edit. Uh, so for me, I mean, I've done, I've always been a bit of a techie. I'm okay with that, but I've never worked on Pro Tools. And um, we had a direct single signal going with the guitar as opposed to the amps, just so in case there was a problem with the amps, he could he could reamp it. Right. And that means now you're now you're editing more than one track at a time, which means you got to fold back the two things at once. Mm -hmm. So I had a bit of a nightmare, like technically 
for me, but I learned a lot. And I guess at the end of the day, I, I'm way more um, capable because <laughs> of it. So it was it a took bit of away from it for a while. Then you got to remember it all, right? <laughs> you know what? You're absolutely right. It's already been two or three, two or three four months. And I came in here to work the other day and I went, how do I turn that on? <laughs> I had to see it for five minutes going logically. Okay, it goes from there to there. To... Anyway, yeah. So, so working, well, that's in the, working in the studios, I mean, I, I, I interviewed Dandy Timmons a couple weeks ago, and the interview just posted today. Um, yeah. But it, he did an old Beatles song, and he recorded it in Abbey Road. Oh, nice. Abbey Road. And he yeah. was talking about the microphones that, the Beatles used way back then, they're still using them today. And so, yeah. you know, I've talked to other people who've recorded Muscle Shoals and, you know, all that. Do you find that for you, and especially working at Collins' uh, studio, and he's obviously recorded other people there, do you feel like there's kind of almost like a, a spiritual or sonic patina that's in a studio that you you feel it as a musician? You walk in there and it's very palpable to you. Absolutely. I mean, I, I actually, my last record was mixed at Abbey Road Studios. Um, that's right. But, I forgot about that. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, yeah, there's the, there's the studio itself and how, you know, and there's just, sometimes it's, um, sometimes it's just luck. Uh, everyone in the room that day, I mean, what makes a track great? You know, that's, you, you know, sometimes it's just the magic of, of that day. For some reason, how everyone's playing together. I mean, I, I cut a Van Morrison song years ago, uh, Into the Mystic, and um, mm -hmm. it did, you know, quite well. And, and at the time, we thought, oh, we'll just hide it in the back of the record. No one expected much of it. And it ended up doing more business than anything else on the record. Wow. Much to everyone's surprise. And I think the beauty of that recording was it was live. Uh, it was the very last thing we did. We had a long two days of tracking, and I pleaded to my guys in the studio before we did it. I said, I know everyone's tired. Would everyone mind if we just took another shot? Because we had tried it, and it, and it wasn't working. And I said, would everyone mind just trying one more time for the last thing we do of the day? And everyone said, all right, you know. And we got magic. And I don't know what it was that day, but everyone leaned into the song in a certain way. And the way the song lifted, nobody could predict it. It was, it wasn't gear. It wasn't microphones. It was energy. Yeah. Yeah. So there's that there's techno there's technology and a studios, a studios, uh, uh, ability to get that. And then there's just magic. And yeah. I love the fact that that's that one thing you can't quantify, you know, you can't predict it and you can't manufacture it either. No, yeah. you, no, you cannot. It's just, it's like chemistry that even with, if it's the same people over and over, you know, it's like family reunions or class reunions, things like that. It just, something happens, yeah. you know? The only bad thing about that track, I can tell you, and I don't know why I'm going on about that, but it's an example. At one point in the song, we were having such a good take. I was so excited. And I leaned back to, to do a, a lick. It's too late to stop now. I, I sang that. And then I was so flat and I don't, you know, I don't, I don't tend to sing flat, but I did. And I yelled the F, F word so loud that it leaked into the drums. <laughs> so we spent like a half a day trying to extract my uh, expletive. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sometimes it, you, there's only so much lipstick you can put on the pig, right? So, <laughs> <laughs> That's right. so yeah. I know it's always hard to pick a song. And it's never, I don't say they're favorites, but what on this album, um, what song would you point to as a calling card? And I'll tell you mine first, because I, I mean, first of all, it's hard to pick one as a calling card for this, in my opinion, but right. I just absolutely love Too Far Gone. I just. Well, that's the song I couldn't remember the title of a second ago. <laughs> that's the Ruby. That's the one that Ruby Amenfu. Oh, okay. All right. Thing is on. And she's doing that really pretty singing on those choruses. Mm -hmm. And, uh, mm -hmm. She's written songs for her, you know, the woman who closed out the Olympics. Uh, yeah. She's uh, she's just soulful, man. And um, 
I don't sing with, I haven't sung with a lot, like with women on a track a lot in my life. In fact, Bonnie Raitt sang on my second record many years ago. Mavis Staples sang on um, Bad Habits years ago on Freedom. Mm -hmm. And then uh, really since then, I don't know, or just a couple backups maybe on a record, but no one um, really taken stage. So anyway, I love Too Far Gone. That was a writing session where, um, and it's funny, you know, because we thought the chorus might be too obvious when we wrote it. And I think we all had a bit of, we were second guessing the chorus. And I think I went, no, no, I think it's fine, you guys. <laughs> I think it's too... So we had a bit of an argument about it, but I, to this day, I think it's, it's, it's more than fine. And um, I'm glad you like that song because that's one of my faves on the record too, for sure. Just the feel, the vibe of it, the tone, everything the style you know on the guitar just the the everything about it i i don't know how to describe certain things on guitars only guitar play is an air guitar anymore but uh right. there's just the licks in there everything the feel of it just um like i said i hit the repeat button a lot on that one so it's oh, uh, nice. well it's got that r b it's got a bit of like r b like a soul ballad to it but it's um uh we have an echoplex on the guitar a really nice vintage kind of fifties echo. No, but I, 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 that one, I was really, that's probably the one I listened to the most really? after the record P protection, just because yeah. I couldn't believe I was singing with Lucinda Williams, you know, <laughs> like I've been a fan of hers. What, when I first heard car wheels on a gravel road, mm -hmm. when I first heard, uh, name me down in another night, uh, 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 it's over. Oh, but, but I can't let go. When I first heard Can't Let Go, I was driving my car and it came on and I went, who the eh is this? And I had to pull over. I went, it's not Bonnie. No, it's not. Who is that? You know, and ever since then, I've just been a, a massive fan of her writing too. Like it's one thing that she's such a great stylist, but as a writer, I don't know if she's got a parallel out there <laughs> uh, as far as volume and intensity of her writing, you know? Mm -hmm. So anyway, I was, I was, you know, I was, the whole record was like that though, playing with Charlie Drayton, you know, especially if we did a song, uh, there's a love song that I, I, I wrote that I sang at my daughter's wedding, uh, mm -hmm. how it feels to be loved. Mm -hmm. And, uh, Charlie Drayton, I know he can do that stuff because on take it so hard on the Keith Richards record, they do a Memphis style stacks yeah. song. Yeah. So I knew he would bring it to that song in a huge way. And he, he took it down at the end of the song and he didn't tell anybody he was going to take it down, you know, how it feels to be. And then he went, what? And he, and he, he hit down and went down in dynamics and, uh, didn't warn anybody. So it's all natural what you hear. Wow. And that, that was, that was awesome. Very cool. Good. I mean, we keep going back to these names and these people who haven't you worked with that you, that you still want to. You know, it's a hard question because, uh, I mean, I've never, obviously I've never, well, I've sung with Mavis before. I, I, I love her. Um, a lot of the people like that I really when I was like in my formative years, like John Hammond, I've had a chance to play with John Hammond. Not much, just on one track, on one thing. Uh, and got to know him over the years and I, I adore him. And uh, Mavis, I've had a chance. Albert Collins, I got a chance to play with Stevie wow. Ray Vaughan. I mean, I've been really fortunate. A lot of my people, I'm, I don't know. Um, I don't know, I've never had a chance to really, I knew Charlie Sexton years ago and I've never really had a chance to, I should have gone back and said hi to him when he played with with uh, Elvis Costello. My my management company manages Elvis Costello, and I I didn't go back. I should have gone back and said hi because we haven't said hi in years. Um, Doyle Bramhall, I'm a I'm a fan of Doyle's. I've never had a chance to really meet him much. Um, yeah, there's some people out there I'm a, I'm a big fan of, uh, but uh, I I must say I've been really fortunate to a lot of people I was, you know, fans of. I've had a chance to meet. Cool. Ry Cooter. I've never had a chance to play with Ry Cooter. I guess oh. Ry Cooter. I named my son after him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my son's just, name's Rylan. You mentioned Stevie Ray Vaughan. I um, before I started Boomerasi, I was you know in Dallas, and uh, I actually went to his funeral. Right I there did too. Dallas. You were I there? Was there? No way. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah. The Lord's Prayer uh, by Stevie Wonder. 
And yeah, uh, but Stevie Wonder, Bonnie Raitt, and Jackson Brown singing Amazing Grace. Oh, yeah. One of the uh, coolest, Jeff, I walked up right when that happened. Well, Charlie Comer, Stevie's publicist, mm -hmm. was my publicist. Ah, okay. I was supposed to play with Stevie a week after he died in London, England at the Hammersmith. Wow. So I had finished up a tour with Michelle Malone, who's mm -hmm. a, a Alabama gal. Mm -hmm. uh, is she a Georgia or is she Alabama? She's from uh, Atlanta, Georgia. Okay. And anyway, we'd finished, uh, and that's when the accident happened, you know, and, and me and my wife uh, went back to Vancouver and then got a call that we, we were straight to Dallas. So you were there. That I was, was crazy. There. We, yeah. Me too. I had the I pictures of it, but I lost them in the divorce. So. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah. But yeah, well, I walked up. I got it. I actually had a picture of Stevie, Bonnie, and, uh, and, and Jackson. That, I mean, I walked right up, had the camera with me, and I snapped that picture. They were standing oh there. Of course, God. they had, you know, the painting of Stevie with his hat, and it was all on a tripod, and you could see yeah. the family, you know, Jimmy and the family, the guys yeah. the top were there. Um, Jeff Healy was there. I oh, was there. I didn't there. know that. I didn't know Jeff, Jeff was there. Yeah, wow. Jeff was there. Yeah. Yeah, it was a heavy, heavy day. I remember the photographers up on the hill above the above the, just like a, like just a train of photographers snapping pictures from a distance. And yeah, uh, yeah, it was a heavy day, man. That was just, you know, I went, ended up going to England and playing a show with Los Lobos at the town and country. But had I not, had Stevie not gone into that, you know, that terrible accident, my introduction to London, England would have been the Hammersmith, you know, and I found the poster the other day from the Hammersmith. Oh, wow. Wow. So I, I thought to myself, you know, it was a week in front of him passing. So there must be a, a poster. I don't know why I didn't think of it till now. So about about six months ago, I'm, <laughs> it was like five in the morning. For some reason, I was up and I typed in Steve Rivon, Colin James, uh, the venue in London, Hammersmith. And I'll pop this poster from a poster collector. So I um, took a picture of the picture because they had done a beautiful picture, had it framed sent straight to a canvas shop where they, where they they made a poster and sent it to me. I got it in my garage. Oh, cool. So, yeah, it's very yeah, cool. Yeah, that's kind of neat. But, I've yeah, had the privilege of interviewing Jimmy Vaughn since then three or four times. Got to meet him in person when he played here in, in uh, Knoxville, which I live up in the Smokies, but Jimmy couldn't be a nicer guy, you know. Nice. And, and just, but Man, I can't believe you were there at Stevie's funeral. People don't yeah. believe that I was there, but I was there. I got in trouble with my ex-wife because I had the day off and I was, my daughter was off from school. She was preschool at the time. I was registering for college. I worked a full-time job and was registering to restart my education. And, um, and I had strict orders not to go to the funeral. Well, oh, wow. I, my daughter expressed interest and I wanted to be a good dad. So we went to the fair. Right. So. Oh, there you go. Well, you, I think you made the right choice. Yeah, I think I did too. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, a um, couple more questions for you. Um, what do you, I touched on this earlier, but I want to hear your opinion of it. And that is, what do you think the state of the blues is today? Are you excited about it? Do you feel like we're, are people taking too much for granted? Do you think, what, what's your take on it? It's a big question. Um, well, you know, obviously, you know, the, the forum is always going to have new fans. I was talking to someone the other day and technology has brought us a lot of good things. Not just, I mean, sometimes it's bad, but sometimes it's great. A young kid now who's 14 years old can watch Sunhouse, can watch Albert Collins live in Japan, can, you know, can get his hands on everything. When we were younger, you couldn't get your hands on anything. You had to go to the public library. You, you, I need to find a Chuck Berry record. Yeah, you, you, you'd yeah, go through bins that. and <laughs> yeah, you go through bins of used record stores. You'd never find what I, I at least I rarely found what I was looking for Thank until you. we had the streaming services where I could figure out where that came from. You know, the bad thing obviously uh, is the fact that monetarily and 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 uh just making a living at this has become so much harder it's so much harder for a young musician to get out in this world because so many people putting material out now and um flooding the market 
and when there really is no market. Yeah. <laughs> so those are the confusing things about it. And I think the budgets have gotten, you know, we have less money to work with when we make a record now. So we have to find ways. And, um, you know, where it used to be, you could sit in a studio for three weeks. Now you got to get in and out in two days and take it home. Yeah. Um, so for me, making records is more difficult because I used to go do beds for a week. And then the band would fly home. I'd fly home, say, you know, hi to my wife. I'd fly back to where we're making the record and I'd spend two weeks with the producer sitting right beside each other every day from one to five mm -hmm. or one to eight. Now you got to do it on email. Hey, I replaced Drop the solo boxes. on. Yeah, I replaced <laughs> the solo on that song. Oh, by the way, I think the harmony is sharp on the on the third. Uh, you know, and you have to do it in piecemeal now, and it's just difficult to get all the things you want to say to your co-producer long distance because mm -hmm. the budgets aren't there now. Yeah, and I find that that challenging. And I guess how does that relate to the blues in this day and age? I guess for me. The only thing I find sometimes is that guitar has become uh, a, uh, a, a a way to compete with other guitar players. Yeah, there's this this tendency to I'm gonna outshine you, or I'm gonna I'm gonna <laughs> and I guess I find that frustrating because my heroes like and and you know not just Albert Collins and BB King. Uh, and and Albert King, you know, they were singers and they were players and they told a story with their singing and then they told a story with their guitar. And it was meant to complete the story, not to have a five minute guitar solo. And I guess uh, I long I long for that a little bit, the soul, the soul of it to shine through instead of the. But that's just the nature of it. What can you say? I don't know. Um, some people look for different things in music, and that's just the way. It, that's just the way it is. So, something I thought of though, I, I didn't write this down, but it just popped in my mind. Are you seeing yet the impact of AI on what you're doing, or what you know in the genre at all? I have not, and I'm I'm I, I imagine that you know they're gonna they're gonna go for the Katy Perry's and the the people who are going to, you know, be mass worldwide Bruno Mars style successes right. they are going to get AI first, I'm thinking. Um, I bet you they could do it with anybody, though. And I'm sure if I heard a song that had my voice on it, it would be absolutely shocking. I've 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 I've, I've listened to some radio shows where people surprise the host by taking his voice and surprising the host of his own show with what his voice would sound like AI. And it was shocking to Whoa. the person. They went, oh my God, that's me, you know? So yeah, it is scary. And uh, I mean, all this stuff is scary. It's just as scary as it was when music got taken down by Napster. Yeah, That was scary. And look what happened. You know, uh, record companies made backroom deals with Spotify and Apple, and we're in the same position we always were, just less. Now so, catalog is being bought out. You know, that all converges at some point down the road, right? So yeah, yeah, but, yeah. So you know, it is scary, and I, I just you know, you just got to hope that people's morals will win out at the end of the day. I hope you're right, man. <laughs> <laughs> because I know, I mean, I gotta take I gotta take eight imposters off my website every day. Trying really? to fish money, fish money out of my fans. Yeah. Like eight to ten people a day. And I, I they come from all over the world. And there's people who sit in a in a in a job like this who just do it. They don't they're not after me, but they're after me and 80 people like me, and it's a job for them. And it, you know, to that's a moral issue, but poverty, the need for, you know, who knows? So, that's right. That's right. yeah, what are you going to do? What's next for you, man? I know you got to run, but what's next for you that we can be watching for? You got to be working on another album already. Well, I've, I, I, I try to get right back at it. I had a writing session last week and, uh, you know, uh, but now everything's starting to come up with this. So we, we have a, Canadian tour plan for the just the new year 
uh, like February, March. Mm -hmm. I'm playing a riverboat cruise in France. Uh, in, uh, in October, we're going up from Lyon to Dijon, or from Arles to Arles to Dijon and back. Um, we have um, an American tour uh, starting in uh, a, a, just a quick little jaunt through New York, uh, Philadelphia, uh, St. Louis for the first time in years for me. I haven't been Milwaukee, so we're doing a little a little run in September as a four piece. So I'm looking forward to that. I got a new uh, agent in America and in, in the states down in uh, in Texas. So uh, he seems to be doing a great job. Um, you know, it's still a challenge for me. I'm mostly known in Canada, so for me, that when I come down there, I got I just you know I hope that people come out and see me. And and uh, uh, for years, I've been kind of a household name here in Canada, but I'm still having to work work it down there. So, you know, uh, it's it's uh it's it's a challenge, but. Who doesn't want a challenge? That's I, right. can, I can take things it. Interesting. <laughs> That's it. Yeah. Well, I hope you get down near my neck of the woods sometimes, Colin. I'd love to meet you in person. And uh, as I told you before, I think, uh, but I'm telling you again now, you, my door is always open to you. I love your work and uh, anything I can ever do to help to get the word out, I'd love to do for you. So uh, let's just continue to stay in touch and um, I'll, I'll keep an eye on your itinerary and see if you're going to be within spitting distance of me and uh, come over and shake hands and and just say hi or something. All right. Awesome. And are you in, are you in Tennessee? Or are you in? Yes, no. I am. I'm up in the Smoky Mountains. I'm a couple okay. miles from Dollywood. So. Right. Well, we played the city winery in Nashville a couple of times in the last couple of years. And we played, we've opened up our uh, buddy guy at the, at the Ryman, uh, I guess it was two years, two and a half years ago now, but we do get through Nashville fairly often, but I, South of that, we're playing I was, Florida. I was supposed but... to be at that Nashville show with Buddy. In fact, I just saw Buddy. I, I'm, I'm kind of struck a, a friendship with Greg Guy, his son. Oh, and, oh yeah, uh, he seems like a really great. I've not met. I've met Greg once, but I, not a lot. Yeah. He's a super, he's a... super nice guy, and we hung out a cool. little bit. But they played over at the uh, Harris Cherokee over on the other side of the mountain from me here. So it was super, super nice guy. I interviewed him a few months ago, and they invited me to the show, and he gave me gave me a t-shirt of um buddy guy's legend and, and i at first i didn't notice it and then i looked at it and buddy had signed within the white part oh. of the thing so i'm oh, framing that sucker so <laughs> buddy's awesome that that tour we did together just blew my mind you know i've known him for, i've done shows with him since 80 88 or 89 wow. but that was the first time i got a real chance to do for like we did 22 shows in a row and my he was so kind to get me up on stage all the every night and and uh i loved it i just loved it yeah, well, I'm, I hate yeah. that I missed the, the one in Nashville, but uh, I'm keeping my eyes on you, man, So, because I, I want to meet you in person. But uh, until then, we'll keep doing these kind of things if it doesn't happen before then. And uh, like I said, my door is always open to you. I want to support you as best I can. I appreciate that, man. Thank you so much. All right. Take care and stay safe and well. Will do. Have a All great right, day. Bye -bye. You too. Okay, bye, bye bye. This show was edited and produced by Mike McClellan. The original music, Roll the Dice, was written and produced by Quentin Hope, and Randy Patterson was your host and executive producer.